Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I know it's a bit crazy to bring someone from Oxford all the way down from Uruguay, but this is the context that was my case. I, I live in this country for five years, but just a couple of months ago, I, I moved to Uruguay to work in this one laptop per child program. But I'm not going to talk about that. I will talk about openness. And when we were planning the discussion for this day, I uh, was asked to talk about openness for those who are not familiar with the topic, and at the same time, to provide new challenging ideas for those who are absolutely familiar with the topic. So you might understand that this is an incredible challenge, and I'll do my best, but this is for two different communities, and I think this is the right challenge, because one of my main concerns regarding openness is we haven't been efficient enough in order to spread the message for those who are not familiar with openness. Please come down, there's some space over here. So this was the original uh, title that we used for the session, uh, redefining the value of openness in higher education, but um, I will stress more the beyond bit, beyond in terms of um, different levels of education, and also beyond in terms of combining formal and informal education. Um, this is going to be the channel of discussion for today and later on. And in case that uh, you are really busy, in case you are checking your emails, in, in case that you are doing the kind of things that our students usually do when we are giving the lecture, which is absolutely fine for me, I can summarize the whole lecture in this phrase. The opposite of open isn't closed, the opposite of open is broken. This is a Bill Bank phrase, and I think somehow summarize some of the things that I'll present today. So let's start with the first chop of it, which is the introductory part, and then we will go to the second, that is a more sort of forecast perspective of it. So many of you might be familiar with this phrase. The future is already here, but it's unevenly distributed. Now, we can, we can rephrase this <coughs> idea, this concept, which has a lot to do with the spreading of innovation. For instance, talking about weather. When I was living here, I learned that the good weather is here. Unfortunately, it's unevenly distributed along Europe. Um, but we can bring and borrow that concept to think about openness in education. <coughs> Open education is already here, but it's unevenly distributed. And that has a lot to do with the diffusion of innovation that we face in every one of our institutions. We have early adopters, people pushing forward, latecomers, and a large majority who are in the middle. And I think this conversation is mainly focused on those. Um, I guess my first, my first idea is this idea that knowledge, the concept of knowledge, is changing in a more comprehensive way. It's changing in terms of the platforms. It's not only this transition from atoms to bytes. It's changing in terms of uh, redefining who produces the knowledge and this coexisting between experts and amateurs. It's changing in terms of the organizations and the redefinition of how organizations behave in this more network-based structure of information production and consumption is shaping and is changing also in terms of the redefinition of disciplines. Disciplines between, the boundaries between disciplines are more liquid today, if we can use Bauman concept. It's not that disciplines are uh, not relevant today, but the breaches between, the connection between disciplines are particularly relevant. So it's not only the amount of information that is incredibly um, overwhelming today, but the shape of the information and the the, the speed that it gets updated is something that it really challenges those institutions which use knowledge as a, as, a, as a core element. Let me start with this video. I remember being bored a lot. It didn't bring out the best in me, and uh, um, you know, I got through it anyhow. So, it's, you know, it wasn't, I was not a great fit, or the system was not a great fit for me. Uh, it's kind of crazy when you think about it that we take all these children and we force them to try to adapt to this really complex bureaucracy, this, this system. The system should adapt to them. There's a very big difference between access to information and school. They used to be the same thing. Information is there online to anyone. Connectivity is actually opening up the world. Educate a youth and you educate a nation. Knowing, knowing something, is probably an obsolete idea. You don't actually need to know anything. 
you can find out at the point when you need to know it. So the last one is Sugata Mitra, as you may know. Um, and he suggests this interesting provocation. The idea of knowing is an obsolete idea. Is that true? Is that entirely true? Um, at least I would say that knowledge is changing. And this idea of learning just in case now is changing or is coexisting with this idea of learning just in time and knowing how to access the proper knowledge in the right time. So if I ask you, what can you give away without what can you give without giving it away? What kind of things came to your mind? Smile. A smile, that's a beautiful answer. <laughs> what else? Ideas. Ideas. Great. Any other? Knowledge. Knowledge. Wonderful. The funny thing is David Welly, when he brought this question to a large crowd, some of them answer a disease, which is not the kind of thing that I was planning to get in as a response. But definitely, knowledge is one of the things as love as well. One of the things that we can share without losing it. And, and a good uh, conceptualization of that is suggested in this book, Understanding Knowledge as a Common, uh, from Hess and Ostron. And the diagram looks a little bit like that. They combine two different dimensions, the level of restriction and the different um, property, which could be either private or public. So according to this diagram, you can have something that has a low level of restriction and a private property, which could be, for instance, a newspaper. So you may not have access to one specific newspaper, which is copyright, but because the low scores of that, you can have access to other one. Now, we can have higher levels of restri restriction with private property, which could be, for instance, a pharmaceutical cure for a terrible disease. And they may have the copyrights of that, and they may decide if they want to release it or not, which could be something that we can discuss from the ethical point of view, but it's something that has a high level of restriction because it has a um, private property. Now, we can combine these dimensions, and we can go for high level of restriction with, as a public good, for instance, a random book that is in a public library. But there's only one copy of that book in the library, so if somebody else takes that book, you won't be able to grab that book till this person brings it back. So it's a high level of restriction, and this is the final dimension in which you have public property and low level of restriction. And I think one good example of that are the online open access resources, either published, papers published in open access journals or open educational resources. And this is one of the big, big redefinitions of the current context. We can combine the format with the licenses that can allow us to have a much more diverse, a, a much more diversified ways of using contents. Now, we know that knowledge is sharing. And we hear that all the time. And I, in order to explain that, I thought was interesting this concept from the Japanese design, wabi-sabi. Are you familiar with it? They mentioned that the beauty of seeing is unrefined and unconventional. But the key point is they mentioned that design is imperfect, impermanent, and incomplete. And this is entirely close to the idea of concept, to the idea of knowledge that we have today. Therefore, in order to make the education happen, there needs to be sharing sharing between teachers to students, between students to students, students to teacher, and so on. So if there's no sharing, there's no learning, period. We know that. That's why it's that important to understand, for those who are not familiar, I assume that in this disruptive context everyone is familiar, but I have to mention it. That's why it's that important to have a big picture at least of what Creative Commons means in terms of you have a flexibility to choose different flavors of restriction regarding what you want to do with the production that you create. Piece of art, music, songs, videos. You want to allow people to commercialize that. You want to allow, allow people to reuse, redistribute, improve, change. So you pick up the flavor that you want. But it's important this is not a discussion of lawyers or geeks. It's a much more broader discussion. Because I think it's embedded in the key principles of learning. And openness is something that goes along different, different contexts and different uh, disciplines. Openness has been well embedded in the principle of open source and this idea of collaborating for, a, for an ultimate goal that is beneficial for the whole community. Licenses, like the one that I mentioned a minute ago, governments have been embracing the idea of transparency with the idea of opening up some of the things that are happening. And we are 
in this challenge today that some governments are promoting the idea of openness, but at the same time, with the same principles of transparency, they are spying our private information, that we have some challenges there, are plenty of them. And science, not only in terms of open dissemination of science, but also open production of science. So we have these two stages in science that are particularly relevant. And education, which is um, the beauty queen of this week, um, probably can be well represented by the idea of open educational resource. Plenty of definition of them, but key ideas are freely, openly available resources that can be reused, can be redistributed. The idea is they have open copyrights or public domain licenses, and they are there to support the access to knowledge. This is the key concept of open educational resource. And the, this, as I, I'm going to show in a minute, has been spreading quickly, and there are plenty of interesting things going on regarding open educational resource. They illustrate this transition from the analog knowledge to the digital knowledge, so low more, social, local, mobile. You know, that is not only interesting because you can access to that, but it's much more interesting because you can change them, you can improve them, you can make them locally relevant, we can create and transform them. Many of these things you are entirely familiar, and I apologize for that, but it's part of the commitment that I, that I made when I came here. From the pedagogical perspective, open educational resource, they increase the value of the curriculum, they facilitate open peer review, they facilitate peer-to-peer -peer informal learning, they are grounded in the idea of the reputational benefit, which is mobilizing many of the non-formal learning initiatives that are taking place today on the internet, increase the sharing of ideas. So there's a quite positive um, ecosystem of benefits behind the idea of open educational resource. So far, so good, I guess, I hope. So there are five R's that define open educational resource. It used to be four, but now they've been increased to five. Probably next talk is going to be six. So these five R's define the ecosystem of production of open educational resource and go beyond, certainly. Retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. I wonder if we are all promoting all these concepts in every single discipline and understanding that each one of them requires different skills at different levels of expertise. But we all are taking part of some of these stages, hopefully most of them. Now, the ecosystem of open educational resource and informal learning initiatives is spreading on the internet. And there are good news regarding that. There are plenty of things taking place today that are important to take into account and to have in the map. That suggests some challenges that I'm going to address in a minute. Let me start with this. I spent like almost $400 a semester on textbooks. I spent around $500. I spent about $700. $425 on books. Over $600 a semester. $500 on my textbooks. Over the last 20 years, the cost of textbooks has increased to almost three times the rate of inflation. 42% of the cost to attend a two-year public college is spent on textbooks and materials. 60% of students who fail to graduate cited the cost of textbooks and fees as a major factor in their decision to drop out. The biggest problem with textbooks is they're very expensive. They're not interesting. They're heavy. The students will buy them and they'll sell them back. If you buy five texts, five classes, new, from a pub publisher, $750 a semester. Introducing Flat World Knowledge, customizable textbooks by expert authors, free online and affordable off. These Flat World Knowledge is one of endless amount of initiatives that are taking place today in the ecosystem of the internet. People providing open access to textbooks. In this case, you can access them for free, but if you want to buy a hard copy of you guys, you want to much more interesting, you want to customize your textbooks, ripping off some chapters, adding all the other ones, bringing multimedia resources into this book, you, you can acquire some of the services that open knowledge is providing. As I said, this is more an example of the things that are taking place. Let me show you another, another one called Boundless. Boundless is the alternative to traditional textbooks at a great price. Free. It's easy. Just tell us what book you've been assigned, and we organize the best content from around the internet to match to your assigned readings, chapter for chapter. We've developed an innovative process that makes this great content relevant to you, saving you hundreds of dollars. But we didn't stop there. Boundless goes way beyond traditional textbooks. Our beautiful e-reading experience lets you easily highlight content and make notes. 
we've developed. So they do something which is interesting but a bit tricky. When you have been asked to bring some textbook to, to your university, to the classroom, they said, let us know the textbooks and we will match every single chapter of that book, with, of that textbook, with other contents that are available on the internet. So there are some gray areas regarding the, uh, the legal concerns and there are some disputes in the US regarding that. But the, the bottom line is they provide free open access to those resources and you want to, if you want to have the enhanced, improved interaction, they will charge you some fee. So now the question is, okay, so if we move in this direction, everything will be sorted. Let me show you the super champion of how to solve the problems. <laughs> you might be familiar with this gentleman. Nicolas Negroponte. He has been asking this interview, I want to show you just a little bit of the, uh, bless you, a little bit of that. How do you respond to those who say students should read books not playing with the computers? Well, th th that's a silly remark because, you know, the, the difference between a book and a computer is, is, is basically zero um, in the sense that uh, physical books are going to disappear. They're going to become screens within a very short period of time because of all sorts of reasons, the economics of it, the environmental impact of it, and just the, the sheer access. Uh, when we ship our laptop, uh, we ship 1.6 million books with it. You can access free 1.6 million books, and embedded in the laptop are 100 books per laptop of the choosing of the country. But what's important about that is when you ship 100 laptops into a village, there are 100 different books on each of the laptops. So the village now has 10,000 books in the village. 10,000 books. I wonder who is going to read those 10,000 books. So it's interesting this idea, this kind of paradigm, because it's not Negroponte, it's a paradigm of the more content we provide, the better education is going to be, right? Um, and this interesting vision of let's provide who those who are lack of content because education will be better, which I think is a beautiful idea. But I wonder to what extent those 10,000 books have been read. I wonder if it wouldn't be a better idea in terms of providing 10,000 books, why don't we provide 50 or 100, which are incredibly well created, analyzed, and kind of disaggregated. This is, this is a, a query that I have that I will try to explore in a minute. So according to David Wallis, which is one of the fathers of the OER when he coined in, in the 90s and this idea of open content, David Wallis said recently that there are over 500 million OER in the world, which is a quite significant amount. And they're increasing in terms of number, and they increase in terms of quality. So, okay, maybe I love the OER, but I'm starting to wonder if we need to provide all the 500 millions in order to have enough education, or we need to take in, get in contact with Negroponte to put more of those concerns on the laptop. I'll try to go deeper on it. So my first question is, or my second question, I don't know the number of the question, do you consider disruptive to share contents in a massive and large scale? online or with the laptops. Keep that question in mind and I'll try to answer, uh, answer that and then we'll have some time for q and I do believe that we need to rethink the concept of openness. We need to rethink the value of openness beyond the idea of providing resources. The first thing to do that, we need to make this clear distinction between free beer and freedom of speech. This tension between free and open that sometimes get, can get wordy, uh, but I think it's really important to address the difference. In many cases, in the Facebook world, in the Google world, many times when something is free, you are the product that is being traded. That doesn't mean always, but in many cases that happens. While with OER, with open, we need to take into account those five R's that I mentioned earlier, where you can reuse, revise, redistribute. So, of course, I couldn't make an accurate discussion today if we, I don't mention the M word, right? I mean, what's the point of talking about openness, openness if you don't refer to the M word that is in every discussion today in higher education? Okay, so MOOCs are awesome because everyone has this kind of laptop that Negroponte is providing with 10,000 books. Interesting, but when you have a closer look of big <coughs> MOOCs providers like these guys in Coursera, and you have a look at their terms, you will find something pretty interesting. 
you may not take any online course offered by Coursera or use any statement of accomplishment as part of any tuition base or for credit certification or program for any college, university, or other academic institution without the express written permission from Coursera. Is that the education of the future that we meant? I mean, if you keep in mind these five R's that we mentioned earlier, not many of them are present here. And this is Coursera, one of the uh, motherships that is behind. Um, I, I wonder why they put the second O, because they don't deserve the second O. Maybe one of them, but the other one is not all that clear that they are all that open. Um, Okay, it's not a problem of Coursera. Uh, these kind of challenges is go way beyond that. One is the high level of dropouts, and two, this still reinforcement of distinction between the haves and the have-nots, and the clear correlation between those who conclude the courses with those who are highly educated, white males, and in urban areas, so to speak. Uh, so we have a challenge behind. A challenge that some people coin like this, uh, transition from a pedagogy of abundance, dumping contents as much as we can, as Paulo Freire used to call the banking education, and, and a pedagogy that supports a community of individuals in the interaction, which is not really the same. So my second question would be, are MOOCs pedagogically disruptive in this concept of disruption? I think that, was a, that is the right concept to ask that question. And they might be because they have the promise of providing contents for those who might not have access or for those who want to have an informal learning experience. But if you think in, in, in Adrian's talk yesterday, he was talking about these kind of things. He was talking about OER in the old time, which is a thing that has been taking place for a long, long time, almost a century so far. This lovely idea of providing broadcast radio, broadcast television to give education to large level of crowds, which is a lovely thing. But we should put that with a pinch of salt when we see under the MOOC the massive disruption in terms of pedagogical approach. Now, um, one of the things that you realize when you start exploring the openness movement, this is much more than an adoption of some kind of licensing. It's much more than a, a technological feature. It's a cultural practice. When you have a look at how the open access communities work in order to produce non-for-profit projects all around the world in order to facilitate the creation of content, tools, services of open contents that can be reused for everyone, you really understand that this thing is go way beyond the idea of adopting some kind of licensing. And I think a, an example in this country that you should be very, very proud of is what the British Library did when they upload one million pictures to Flickr in, as an open access resource initiative. And that is not only providing contents online, it's a much more relevant, relevant cultural practice of heritage, providing an endless amount of spin-off out, out of that initiative that is certainly more a cultural practice. So let me be for a minute um, an optimist, a naive optimist, and let me for a minute think that we will continue producing large volumes of OER as we have been producing so far, which is great news. Don't misunderstand me. It's not that I'm against that. But if we continue in this phase, it might happen that could be a good opportunity to go beyond contents. It might happen that we might need something more than only providing contents online for free. And for that, I need you to remember this beautiful phrase of Mandela, who said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And for that, I will bring you to Buenos Aires uh, with this initiative developed by this crazy guy called Raul that he calls a weapon of mass instruction. <laughs> like a total artist. He's a poet, man. But he's a poet who can fix about anything he can invent. Raúl, para mí, es um, uno de esos locos lindos necesarios en la sociedad. I have known Raúl since four years, and I still don't know who he is. I know that I'm kind of scared of him, but I really like having him around. Lo que está construyendo Raúl es un misterio. 
Viniendo de él, puede ser una nave espacial. I think Raúl is building a submarine. He builds all kind of stuff. I thought he was working on his car. <laughs> But then he talked a lot of crazy things. Creo que, que es alguien a lo mejor un poco hilarante. Eh, seguramente es un acto de revolución. I think he's building some kind of weapon. It's very strange. Avengers, of course. I'm about to build a weapon of mass instruction. My name is Raul. I'm the creator of the weapon of mass instruction, which is a sculpture that has the ability of transporting books, giving books away, collecting books, making a mess on people's heads. Me gusta leer la lectura on my head too, also. Un libro de poesía. Bienvenido. El arma de destrucción masiva de Raúl es un arma fantástica. My missions are very dangerous. I attack people in a very nice and fun way. Bueno. The weapon of mass instruction, I just love it. I think it's unique. Eh, hey, hermosísimo libro, que lo disfrute. El libro abre la cabeza. Humanity has perpetuated knowledge through books, and I think that they should. Get around more. Puedes llevar un libro gratis si se comprometen a leerlo para la chica de rojo. Te voy lindo, lo vi cara de tanguero. Ahí está, capo, gracias. He's a very unwell adjusted person to this society, which is marvelous too. And, and this guy, this weapon of mass instruction, this adjusted idea of... person to this society, which is marvelous to oh, be next. I want to stop in that image, but anyway. Um, when I saw this tank, I had to think in all the OERs that we provide in these repositories. This lovely idea of providing large volumes of contents to everyone in the world, not only in Buenos Aires, everywhere in the world. We spread these books or these resources of these learning objects, this endless amount of things which are incredibly useful. That's great stuff. But in order to be sure that those books are going to be read, all these things need to happen. In order to be sure that it's not going to be read, but only learn, also learn, all these things need to, needs to happen. So, I'm still wondering if providing contents for free is disruptive enough, at least in this context of disruptive people like you. And I would say in order to make this thing work, we need to combine these three elements. This is not a recipe, but it's a, at least an abstract approach to that. We need to provide these three elements. We need to combine content with context and containers. Otherwise, we will be throwing away books, which is great, but might not be enough. Let me explain you what I mean with that. Content. Well, we have been talking about quite a bit of contents. I would say we are living in, a con in, a, in, a, in an era where contents, high quality contents, are becoming a commodity. Contents are becoming an infrastructure that is easy to access. If you know the right sources to access to the proper information, content today is a commodity. There's abundance of contents, uh, lack of time to access to those contents. Things have been changing. And interestingly, in a world of abundance, what really plays a key role are the search engines, who becomes the gatekeepers in order to see if this is visible or not. So it's not to have it online, but it's to have it visible. How many people are writing books and titles to be sure that this is, these are search engine friendly? Search engines are becoming the gatekeepers of OER and all the openness movement. Let me give you this example. Today, company providers like Netflix, Amazon, or Spotify are offering us these services that you can pay one monthly fee and you can consume as much as you can. A kind of 
all you can eat sort of thing, but in terms of contents, right? That's interesting. That is really changing um, the current digital ecosystem, but I wonder to what extent that, that is not similar to the things that are happening today in higher education, where you have an endless amount of high quality resources over there. And the problem is not the access to contents, but what you do with them. Let me go to the second aspect, containers. Could be the tank, could be a repository, could be a USB, could be a Bluetooth. A minute ago I showed Negro Ponte who, was, who embraced in the last decade this idea of one laptop per child, but it was in the era of personal computers and we have been in this transition from personal computers into more mobile devices, also called bring your own device that is really fragmenting the whole infra technological infrastructure. This is part of what's, what is going on today. There are interesting trends nowadays, not only making technology more invisible, but also making uh, the pos allowing the possibility of building your own technology. And I don't mean only uh, Raspberry Pi, but I mean these kind of things that you might be familiar with. So for the next Christmas, you know which kind of phone you have to order, or you have to come down here with the guys of Disruptive Lab to ask them to buy this kind of toys over here. Uh, this may or may not happen, but what the key point when we think in this kind of coming technologies regarding education is what was discussed yesterday the whole day, which is technology itself is not disruptive. It won't make any change. The changes are in the cultural mindset that we can promote or disseminate or, uh, or motivate among teachers and learners. This is a key point. So regardless of the technology, that's what I think we can use all technologies with new, with new, with new uh, approaches. And I think here is the clue. This is the concept that really is not that, that easy to, sc to scale up. This is the concept that sometimes is missed in many of these initiatives that embrace the idea of openness, in many of these ideas that are Technology-enhanced learning, context is something that is much more tricky to, to multiply. Let me, let me show you what I mean. We have all these self-learning and micro-environments that are taking place today. I would say Starbucks is a brilliant example of that. But we have Fab Labs and even Meetup and a large number of initiatives that go way beyond the classroom but are useful for implementing the self-directed capacity of building. And I think this is interesting because this is suggesting a, trans a new transition from the content production to co-producing informal and non-formal opportunities for learning. And I'm going to give you an example. Are you familiar with this platform called Meetup? Meetup is this platform where you say, I'm in Coventry and I would love to learn how to cook Thai food. Who else would like to take a course on that? Who else would like to read books of Shakespeare and share thoughts? It's an informal network when people meet according to a common interest and a common location. So, as you may guess, because Coursera is such a big network, there are plenty of people who are in the same city taking the same course. <coughs> so, in some places more than others, but if it wouldn't be strange that you are in California or in London and you say, I'm in this city and I'm taking this course of artificial intelligence, who else would like to meet up in order to share some things regarding to the course? Um, and this is, believe me, has been growing massively. Thousands and thousands of micro-communities, informal communities of learning who have been using this platform to connect. The good news is this information in the platform is open access, so you can pull out the data with an API and make analysis, which is what we did. So we wanted to understand why people are having the hassle of meeting with others uh, 
that you may not have any personal interest with, with, but you have something in common, which is you are taking this course. And we found incredible things. I'll bring you only one quote, which I think in a way can help to illustrate part of this, of this discussion. A guy opened this invitation to the entire world. Meet up for a brainstorming idea sharing, or, and this is my favorite part, sit quietly while, with your headphones in while doing classwork with the satisfaction of knowing that people around you are working on the same thing if you have a question session. Isn't it a strange invitation? So let's meet up, but not necessarily. We're going to talk. Let's going to be together. So in case I, I need you, I can grab your hand and say, I don't understand this bit. Why on earth we need to have that if we have plenty of information on the internet? Why on earth we have that if we have people like this gentleman that I showed earlier providing, providing thousands and thousands of contents on laptops? And I think because, because we have the need of closeness. We have the need of community, sense of community. And one of the interesting things that is behind this Meetup initiative is this is not something that was designed by the Coursera people. It was designed by the learners who said, I would love to have an informal community where I can share with others, look at the eyes, and say, I'm not understanding this thing. And this is the challenging bit that is beyond the internet, the creation of context. So here we have this challenge today. How can we scale up this thing? Great. Some people may think that this is the solution. Right. So a kind of learning machine, plug in your head, putting all the contents for free. That's OK. I mean, and we did try this thing with a number of technologies. But I think the challenge is much more in this direction. And I only use the case of uh, Starbucks, but uh, many other companies or uh, spaces can be illustrative of that. People using informal places for co-learning with others, with this abundance of information. If we don't have this context of learnings, it's quite challenging that the content and the container will be enough. I guess the challenge is, how can we adjust education, which is more constrained, is more defined, is more organized, into learning, which is much more chaotic, which can take place in any context, in any moment, in a more unpredictable way. Therefore, I think we need to transfer the discussion from OER into OEP open educational practices. As Farrow said, it makes little sense to talk about OER if we don't embrace the idea of open educational practices. That means learning to learn, self-direct learning, entrepreneurial kind of learning, hutagogy, which is something that unfortunately is not well discussed in the current context of education. Be designers of your own learning. Let me, let me finish with this, with this concept. Um, we are in this transition from the elite into mass and universal. And in order to illustrate that, I will use this article published almost 40 years ago, well, more than 40 years ago, uh, by Martin Throw. And he wrote this article called Problems in the Transition from Elite to Mass Higher Education. He wrote this book in the early, in the early 70s. And he said by then, the access to higher education was only for the privileged, 50% of the population. He was using the, 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 the UK and the US cases. He was saying by then, the access to higher education was for a small community, and then it was a privilege. And then in his, in his analysis, he foresaw the idea that this thing was going to transition from elite into a mass higher education, in which a higher volume of people was going to have access to that. By then, the access to higher education was not going to be anymore a privilege, but a right. And this is a cultural change. And then he updates his work in the 90s. And he thought that it wasn't enough with the mass, it wasn't enough in terms of his analysis, the ideas of mass higher education, and he thought there was going to come a universal higher education, in which something like 50% of the population or more could have access to these courses. And then it's not a privilege, then it's not a right, it's an obligation or an added value, according how you want to say it. It's a different context. It's a different kind of perception of the value that education can provide. Um, so it's tricky to think in the, in the coming university with only this idea of 
the old school way of understanding the higher, the higher education. So we have this, we are in this transition. In some countries, it's taking place uh, faster than in others. But if we have a look at what Gordon Brown suggests in the last World Economical Forum, where he said that the, we have been witnessing the highest rise in tertiary education ever seen from the 2009, so, sorry, from the 1990 to 2009, which has been 160% of increase in the global enrollment, people trying to move beyond the, um, the manual works, it's quite clear that we cannot scale up higher education with the, with the model that we used to have. I don't have the clue. I only, bring, I only brought troubles to you. The projections, according to uh, John Daniels, from the former president from the Commonwealth of Learning, uh, they were, he said that tertiary education will pick up up to 260 um, million by 2025. And that will require 98 accommodating almost 100 million students. And that will mean to create four major universities every week for the next 15 years. I don't really mind if it's 15 years or 50 years, but you understand the big picture is something that is far beyond reality, at least under the current context. So for me, it's really clear that in this context, we need to think in a much more open way of understanding education, which is much more social, distributed, adaptive, globally friendly, than the current models that we have today. And for that, I want to finish with a couple of ideas. The first one is that this distinction between face-to-face -face and online that is blurring in social interactions should be equally blurred when we think in online and open. My second idea is that I think we need to go in the direction of supporting those much more diverse and concurrent learning pathways, like the open digital budgets, like the nano degrees, like the Open Education Resource University, which is offering a much more flexible ecosystem of recognizing knowledge in a much more, in a much more diverse uh, context of learning. I said learning, not education. And that will mean design much more cross-institutional and contextual collaborations where the network is the learning. This is George Seaman phrase. I think it's really valid, valid here. The network is the learning. It's not only the access to contents, but it's the way that you connect content, context, and containers. An openness should not be confused with the marginal cost of ed educational resources. Openness is how digital technologies continue challenging the normative assumptions that we make about education today. So just to finish, um, and using the phrases of disruption, I think now it's time to generate new forms of critique and creating different kinds of alternatives to higher education if we, we, if we really want to embrace the openness that is behind all this discussion. Thank you very much.